just a quick overview on the meeting. Uh, amazing energy level to the very end uh, last night until 7.30, we're 90% full here. So really a tribute to the people that come to this meeting and the energy level and the dynamics of the meeting are tremendous. Um, I just jotted down throughout the day a few interesting comments and we can comment on it amongst here. Um, it was great that one of our patient families yesterday, uh, um, the mom said, uh, patients and families also need to get educated in AI medicine. We're kind of surging ahead, trying to follow our tech um, colleagues, but the families should not be left behind, so I remember that comment. Uh, Randall Wetzel said, physicians are from Venus and data scientists are from Mars. We're from different planets, so we're gonna have to try to learn from each other and check your hubris at the door, as I always say. Um, the algorithms need to be continually revised for models to maintain relevance. So it's not a one-time thing that you bring an algorithm and a model that works and expect it to work you know, a few years later, particularly if you are going to a different hospital with that particular algorithm. And lastly, just like to add that education for the clinician should not include just data science, which is kind of attractive right now, but just about data in general. Uh, I think we don't spend enough time learning about data in general. So one of the things I love about uh, putting this meeting together with all of your input is that it's truly multi-specialty. Um, probably have met subspecialists from all of these categories throughout the years uh, that we've done this meeting. Um, and I just, someone asked me uh, just a couple of days ago, I'm a radiologist, um, I just want to come and see if I still have a job five to ten years from now. So I presented this at Exponential Medicine, but let's look at the brain in terms of the left brain and the right brain. So the left brain does perception, um, model image uh, medical image interpretation, as well as data analytics. So that's sort of the data science side of the brain. And then the right brain is the creativity side, it's the cognition, so complex decision making and creative problem solving. So if you think about what a radiologist does, and I put in an extra category for procedural tasks, procedures basically. So this is what a radiologist does. So this is what they do, not what they can do. So if you're a radiologist, don't be offended that I think this is how your brain's working, but this is what you actually do day to day. So you do less cognition, but more perception. Um, if computers can do more perception work, um, and by the way, um, the number of medical images just exponentially escalating all the time because it's, if it's cheap and it's available, and particularly now if computer vision can read those medical images, then people are gonna want more of those, right? So um, there's not gonna be a shortage of medical images that need interpretation by both machine and human. So I think human's gonna actually potentially have even more work to do, despite the automatic reading. And perhaps they can ex also explore the right side of their brain to do their jobs as well. So I actually don't anticipate radiologists to be losing their jobs, but if you don't make AI relevant in your job, perhaps you'll be made, rendered less relevant. I think that's the bottom line. Um, it's multidisciplinary here. We have representation from all sectors, and um, half or about 40, 50 percent are clinicians. We'll do the final numbers later. It's multidimensional. It's not all about deep learning or machine learning, which is getting most of the publicity right now. We also keep an eye on the AI trends and try to have sessions that talk about what's coming in the future, and we'll have a couple of those sessions tomorrow. It's multi-format, so we try to really mix up these sessions. We try to have 50% presentation and 50% discussion uh, uh, as a format in general, so um, people like that mix, um, and it's pretty fast-paced, and we're international, and this is a year that we went to two additional international locations. Um, don't worry, Freddie, this is not what we're gonna do next year, but, <laughs> but we've been asked by um, this number of cities to bring AI Med to those cities, so I think one of the highlights for me for the year is to interact with physicians from all over the world about this domain of AI medicine. And just to show you the number, someone was asking me how we're doing. So initially started out as a satellite meeting as part of the innovation meeting called Pediatrics 2040 and has really grown in succeeding years. Um, this year with the three international meetings as well as all the breakfast meetings we've done, we've come in close to about 3,000 attendees and hopefully um, we'll get even more people engaged next year. So again, Special thanks to Joe and Massimo coming in and really making a big difference for this meeting in terms of support and all of, and all of our many friends and colleagues that support this meeting. And can we just give the supporters another round of applause, please? Um, 
And speaking of supporters, I have some special guests here at the front table. Um, Bob and Gloria, can you stand up? They represent the foundation board for the Michelle Lund Foundation that really gave us the head start on trying to launch AI in a hospital. So Bob and Gloria. Um, and next to them is my spiritual partner, uh, um, Spiro Moses. And, um, and one last guest is Matt Gerlach, are you here? You just wave your hand. Matt is uh, my boss, the CEO of the hospital, so. All right. So today we're gonna have this keynote session and um, we, again, we're mixing, uh, because the meeting is matured, so we're mixing theoretical sessions with real life application sessions and we'll continue to blend um, those two um, areas. And then we have uh, an abstract session this evening, um, some 50 plus young investigators and sometimes not so young investigators presenting their work in AI in healthcare. So please support them by um, going to these sessions. And then tomorrow uh, we have a fabulous keynote session and sort of the best of Silicon Valley. So we have Jack Hittery, Jack Poe from uh, Google and um, Jeff Rutledge from um, one, of the, one of the companies in Silicon Valley. So you'll hear sort of in real time what's happening in Silicon Valley and then an, an amazing program to finish the day and we'll be done around 1 12 o'clock. So here's the AI trivia question for the day. In addition to the Laguna shirt, we're gonna throw in a spa treatment at the Ritz here. So again, since I'm a proponent of machine and human, you're allowed to search, okay? <laughs> um, so here's the trivia question. So everyone, you have to shout it out. Um, Alan Turing. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Turing received his PhD at which university? Oxford's Not yet. Princeton. Who said Princeton? That's correct. <laughs> Round of applause, please. Many people don't know that he actually got his PhD here in the U.S. So uh, I was, but obviously someone I admire. So what are the present challenges, just as an intro comment? So this past year reminds me of my second daughter, Olivia, when she went from one-year-old to two years old. Lots of growth and development. And as any parent here would know, when they start walking, you're in trouble, right? So I feel like uh, we, we're getting into a little turbulent period here. This is my other daughter, Emma. Um, she insisted I put in her picture as well, obviously. So this is her first move with me playing the game Go. And as you know, we talked throughout the meeting about how amazing AI is because it kind of conquered the game Go, beat the human contestant, and amazing work with uh, medical imaging using convolutional neural network and deep learning. But I would offer that biomedicine is much more complicated than interpreting medical images. As impressive as it is, to have medical images read by computer vision. So, and part of the reason is this is the phenotypic expression of obesity. Uh, and this is amazingly complex when you think about all the potential social determinants of health as well. So for me, uh, when people say, well, you know, we've conquered a game go, we're ready to take on medicine, it's sort of like, it's, I, I respectfully disagree that the bio, biomedicine is like the game go. I think it's more like um, real-time strategy games like StarCraft. Um, those of you who are in the ICU can appreciate the visual imagery. This is probably what a, night, a busy night in the ICU feel like. Um, <laughs> not that you're knocking off patients, but um, <laughs> the, it's the, the real-time complexity of making decisions, having sometimes a lot of missing data. And that's what real-time strategy games like. So I, I like to propose that biomedicine is not like the game Go, it's more like real-time strategy games. Uh, another observation I made this year, and I think it's a challenge, is it's, it's gonna be difficult to accommodate innovation. And it's not just for AI, but it's also for advanced technology. So if we look at progress, and we're here, this is um, regulation, and I'm not going to single out FDA. Um, it's just any body that has to regulate, and we'll talk about that later has a limited um, scope and um, a limited and a uh, restricted timeline. But if you look at AI, we're about to be launched here. So how is a regulatory body, any regulatory body, going to be able to keep up 
with the exponential increase and in progress for technology. I think that's going to be an additional challenge. A third challenge is adoption by clinicians. We, the doctors group just met this morning, and we're going to regroup tomorrow morning because there's a lot to do at 7 o'clock. Um, is not just getting educated, but how do we um, bring up explainability for particularly the deep learning methodology? And this is just a graph showing that it's almost like the higher the prediction accuracy, the less explainable it's going to be. So somehow we have to reconcile that big difference. So slow progress is also complicated by burnout. And um, these are 10 top reasons for burnout. And my contention is why not use burnout as a reason to leverage AI to solve some of the problems that physicians face in burnout. Another challenge is the data conundrum in healthcare. That access to big data is very difficult in healthcare. Um, big data is something that's, um, that all data scientists want, but sometimes in biomedicine we have little data. Particularly in pediatrics, you have rare diseases in which there are just perhaps even a dozen patients from around the world. So the data scientists working with clinicians hopefully will find ways, and I think there will be ways, to learn from small amount of data. There are all sorts of developments in deep learning, for instance, one-shot learning, which is just using one case to learn to apply to other cases, as well as creating synthetic data. Some of you may have seen articles that are coming out with deep learning actually creating data based on patients, but synthetic data. So my former mentor, Andrew Ng, says AI is the new electricity. You may have heard that terminology or that phrase before. And I say in medicine, AI is electricity, except that we have a primitive hut, hut with a single light bulb. So we're not really taking advantage of that amazing resource. The last challenge, or last challenge I have here, there are many challenges in general, is that both humans and machines can have bias. And sometimes we're a little bit unfair to the machines, as I said yesterday. We have higher expectations of our machines than sometimes we have of ourselves. So like how we deal with our children. Um, and to partly um, uh, take care of that issue, uh, we spent a lot of time this year in making sure that we have as diverse a faculty as possible. And um, this is... Um, our philosophy for the meeting that will increase diversity as much as we can. And so I want to take this opportunity to thank our very diverse faculty uh, for being here as well. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Um, so um, I'd like to end the session, uh, end the, my part of the session with a quote. This is someone amazing that I finally got a chance to meet this January at his cookout in Cayman Islands, and I think most of you know Anthony Bourdain. He's an amazing um, glo global citizen because he promotes goodwill um, through um, food and cooking. And I think this is how we can look at AI right now, that maybe that's enlightenment enough to know that there is no final resting place of the mind, no moment of smug clarity, but perhaps wisdom is realizing how small I am and unwise and how far I yet to go. So that's kind of how I feel about AI in medicine, is that I have a lot to learn, but hopefully um, that's the reward um, the way it is. And uh, I just had the pleasure of having lunch with him twice that, that week. As you know, um, he left us in June, and I um, really miss his amazing wisdom, and also um, a really, really humble person at the same time. So um, some of you have been asking me, so I'm excited about the meeting and what everyone's talking about. Where do I go from here? Um, thanks again to a generous grant from our um, donors and um, Freddie and his team for AI Med. We put together this amazing website with all the resources, all the talks from previous meetings. The ebook it's in its 3.0 version. It's free to download as well as the academic magazines. And Freddie and I are working on uh, something that I was asked to do last year and we're in the process of finishing, which is the top 100 articles to read in AI and medicine. And I'm going to make this actually a crowdsource project. So I'm going to start nominating articles and based on sort of like an iTunes concept, if you like it, you can vote yes and then we'll see how the crowd does. And we'll actually have authors of those papers perhaps come next year and present the papers, okay? And uh, please have a good time in Laguna and take a little time off tonight. It's an off night after the abstract and enjoy Laguna Beach. 
um, in its Christmas mode. So uh, my girls wanted to say uh, Merry Christmas, okay? So thank you. All right. <clears throat> Daniel. All right, thanks, Anthony, and uh, <laughs> congratulations on the growth of AI med. Can I have my first slide up? I thought of, I was going to come up with a new name for AI, so I came up with augmented intervention, which is sort of the theme of my talk. Someone trade that, trademark that for me. Um, I think we also think about augment, uh, augmented uh, prevention. I just took a nice uh, beach walk. So I'm, while I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the sick care of the side of the equation, obviously prevention is number one, and that's part of the future of healthcare. Actually, there's a new edition of National Geographic, the January one, all around the future of medicine. Um, I got the, had the privilege of writing the opening piece, uh, which has a, quite a bit about AI and intelligence in prevention and therapy. So take a look at it. It's all online now. It's going to be, I think, a, a nice, impactful um, addition. Um, so, I'm going to kind of focus more on the sort of intervention and sick care side of the equation. And let's realize that, you know, today in the United States alone, we really live in more of a, you know, of a, of a, a sick care world where we're, there's over 4.5 billion drug prescriptions prescribed uh, every year. That's 15 for every man, woman, and child in the U.S. And, uh, you know, sadly, you know, even for the top 10 grossing drugs, they only work for about one in four to about one in 24 who take them. So it's great if you're number one, but, you know, what about everyone else? So we don't really practice, we really have imprecision medicine rather than precision medicine. And often many of the drugs that we take, common ones like aspirin, don't work for a large fraction of the population. So we hope they help uh, in terms of cardiovascular protection, but about one in three to about one in four, at least Caucasians, uh, are aspirin resistant. So <clears throat> while they uh, don't even benefit from aspirin, they have the risk of GI bleeds and other complications that, that kill thousands every year. So, so we have grand challenges in, in the medicines we take. Uh, most of them we don't even take effectively. Um, so there's great cost and challenges in hopefully picking the right therapies going forward. Part of these challenges and the drug-drug interactions, in some cases, and Joe can talk more about this, the number four leading cause of death in the United States uh, may be uh, adverse drug, re drug, drug responses. And I have a bit of a lens on this. I trained in both pediatrics and internal medicine, so I spent time like, you know, on call as an intern in the NICU, maybe carefully dosing to the fraction of a milligram uh, or, you know, per kilo uh, a dose of a, a drug, and the next night I might have been in the emergency room, you know, seeing a 100-pound, you know, frail nursing home patient, and the next minute, you know, a 300-pound football lineman, who each would get the exact same uh, uh, dose of, of medication. So we're often in the sort of one-size-fits-all realm of healthcare, particularly once we get into, into the adult range. And I, I think uh, as we move forward, we need to think of new creative ways to address uh, picking the wrong drugs, uh, addressing the right dosing, and addressing adherence, hopefully to folks taking the prevention or the therapeutic meds they might want. The challenge is, uh, you know, about 40% of Americans over 65 are on five or more drugs. That's polypharmacy. Uh, and the more drugs you take, the less well we do in taking them. Uh, and the cost of uh, noncompliance or poor adherence is, is massive. You know, billions of dollars in cost, even if you pick a, take a simple drug like a statin, if we improved adherence by 10%, it would save, you know, tens of thousands of lives and, and millions of dollars. So lots of challenges and lots of opportunity to, I think, apply AI and beyond to address these challenges and go beyond the cutting edge of literally cutting pills in half uh, to, to, to dose adjust and, and our cutting edge fax machine era uh, to rethink and reimagine elements of the future of medicine. Now, one of the opportunities, particularly in our new connected mobile age, is that we no longer need to be in the four walls of a hospital to collect our data. We just heard, you know, you can have an EKG on your watch. We're in the era of wearables. Uh, you know, uh, I'm wearing like, you know, 12 versions right now, including a ring. I just got from China, you know, a, a $35 uh, version of a, of a Fitbit, uh, which claims to do oxygen saturation and blood pressure as well. But bottom line is we're moving to an era where we can start to collect data in all sorts of locations and, and hopefully make sense of that. Move from the era of quantified self. Many of us are data geeks and we have the data on our phones. Uh, and our tablets and start to connect that to our healthcare providers. So your clinicians and healthcare teams can see that data often in real time and, and use that to optimize precision wellness uh, and optimizing health span and, 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 and health to doing early diagnostics uh, to then hopefully personalizing and having real time feedback loops for our therapy. And a lot of that is done very empirically today, you know, picking a drug, uh, looking at data that isn't actually integrated information. So as we move from quantified self to quantified health, we need the lens of machine learning and AI and crowdsourcing to make sense of that data to use it in new empowering ways. Let's take a few very common conditions. Hypertension, it's the number one leading cause of early death and morbidity around the planet. 
Uh, about one in, uh, almost half of adult Americans have hypertension. Uh, less than half of them have it well controlled. Uh, and the ability to now detect and measure your blood pressure, shrinking to your uh, you know, connected blood pressure cuff, to your watch band. There are now several startups that are trying to do radar-based seamless ways of 24-7 blood pressure. Um, so hopefully that can make a much better feedback loop to optimize measurement and uh, often taking three or more drug medications. And the, the feedback loops are often very, very broken. Um, and when you don't have good adherence to your uh, blood pressure meds, you end up with strokes and heart attacks, which could be prevented by good adherence. We have, of course, now the era of, you know, the ability to do an EKG on your watch and utilize that to pick up everything from atrial fibrillation to potentially other conditions. And, you know, and uh, now even Band-Aid sized patches can be essentially live streaming an intensive care unit level of, of data. That's an overwhelming exponential amount of data. We want to not just have the data, we want to have the useful information and learn when to hopefully intervene early rather than, than too late. So tremendous opportunities, tremendous challenges, though, to put this together. And I think we have these new sources, uh, you know, the, the, the scales going from weight to tracking shape. So I can now not just get my kilos, but my body mass, my muscle mass, my fat mass, if I had swelling in my legs, that might be indicative of, of a need to do therapy. We can uh, even not wear any device now. Wi-Fi has been engineered by MIT engineers to pick up the vital signs of up to 10 people in the same room at the same time. So we're entering this era of, you know, 24-7 digital exhaust, the challenge is, what do we do with that? And not just our vital signs, but labs are coming to the chip uh, or to our smartphones, so democratizing where and how we can get information well beyond the, the blood sugar. And even though the, you know, the theranoses of the world have, have sort of scurried the space, we are going to see much more ability to collect data uh, at the point of care. Now, beyond vital signs, our labs are also now in the exponential age of genomics. The price of sequencing a genome has dropped at twice the rate of Moore's law. It's less than $1,000 today. Even with your 23andMe data, you can get your pharmacogenetics. How do the genes that you have impact uh, uh, which, uh, sorry, which drugs you might take? Do you want normal dose, low dose? What statin might you need? All those, that data is available today, but it's not integrated into the workflow of the average clinician. So I think a tremendous opportunity is now to take all these new exponential data sets, you know, it's impossible for any one clinician or healthcare system to, to make sense of that. It's confusing. And apply the lens of AI machine learning to make sense of that for particular indications. This is a sketch from Exponential Medicine. It says, what is it, Doc? Just as I thought, you're generating too much data. Data <laughs> isn't necessarily uh, translate to, to better care or better outcomes. And, uh, you know, this is an older quote, but the complexity of modern medicine exceeds the capacity of the unaided human mind. So how do, we, how do we use that to address, let's say, the challenge of, of what medications you might want to take? You want the right dose, the right dose, right, right drug, dose, combination, and time for the individual patient. But again, many patients are on five or more drugs. So I think we need to move to this idea I call it IntelliMD, you know, from TMI, too much information, to total medical informatics, to be able to take all those, these new data sources from not just your vitals, but your social network, how much your activity, your, your, all, all this element, and make it useful. So we use intelligence augmentation to pick the right drugs and uh, right dosing, both for prevention and for therapy and to take existing data sets and to make them useful at the point of care so I don't have to empirically guess what drug to treat. So this will bring us, I think, this era, many have called it the digital twin, where each patient, patient we have or ourselves will have our version in the cloud that can be used in predictive models for prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. Here's one small example, a very common drug, warfarin, Coumadin, a blood thinner. You know, to try and pick the right starting dose is very challenging. You could pick, there's all these factors from age, race, weight, smoking, uh, do you take a statin, uh, your genes. That's impossible to do in your head, but you can put it through this uh, algorithm and it predicts for that individual patient the right starting dose and maintenance dose. So you could try and do that in your head or maybe with this app or try and read all these articles and data and try and make sense of that. I think that's relatively impossible. So we need to take that simple example for a common drug like a blood thinner and potentially democratize that across many drugs and their combinations. So imagine you have you know, five patients all with you know, uh, diabetes and, and heart disease. Normally today, they'd all be roughly on the same drugs, aspirin, beta blocker, digoxin, warfarin, statin, metformin. But if you integrated that data, potentially you can very easily suggest the right optimized set of dosings that are gonna really be tuned to that individual. So great, we now have our optimized selection of drugs, but here's still a cutting edge way of tracking most of our medications, right? That's what most of us or our grandparents might have uh, to track things. We, we have seen some progress. There's now adherence technologies, apps, uh, digital dispensers, you know, uh, 
uh, bottles that will tweet you or call your mother if you don't take your meds, or companies like PillPack bought for a billion dollars by, by Amazon. So there's some progress there. But I would argue you don't want to, have to take a pile of pills that aren't even optimized to you. You should take your own personalized polypill. A polypill is a medication that can combine multiple medications. They're common, like cold and flu medications are a polypill. Uh, and there's been some studies to use polypills in a preventative state, um, giving combinations of low-dose aspirin, beta blocker, statin, ACE inhibitor to folks at risk for heart attack or stroke, and by just taking a single pill a day, dramatically lowered their risk for heart attack or stroke. But those weren't optimized for the individual. What if we could build your own personalized, optimized polypill for prevention or therapy? So this got me thinking, how can we do this in, easy, in an easy, uh, streamlined way in this you know, exponential age? And of course, we're now in the era of 3D printing. You can 3D print braces, orthopedic devices, hearing aids, even maybe devices are going to, and you know, hip implants will be printed in the operating room. So I thought, what if we could print your own personalized medications? I call these an IntelliMed. They'd be based on you. And for example, it would be a combination of, let's say, six meds in a single pill to make it easier to take, and ideally with your personalized doses. So I had this concept. I built a, a personalized printer. And, I'll, and this is basically how it works. Instead of taking, again, six pills, uh, you could sort little micromeds, a milligram or two milligrams each, into a capsule. Uh, these would start with generic drugs that are already able to be taken together. And then you could optimize your dose, potentially on an even uh, daily basis. And you could optimize the pharmacokinetics by different coatings on the micromeds as well. So your printer at your corner, Walgreens or CVS, would have cartridges, not of, of, of ink, but of drugs that could easily sort and build your personalized polypill and drop that off by drone or ship you your weekly or monthly supply. And once that pill is printed, you could do some sort of uh, fun bells and whistles, for example, uh, print uh, you know, the QR on the pill, code on the pill. So it's got your date, the, name, uh, your, the day of the week. You might have a taper of a steroid or an antibiotic or do alternating doses. And um, so that's the basic concept of high level. Uh, this is the prototype printer. It will do uh, 18 different drugs. And it's sort of, uh, there's the, it's, uh, it's not beautiful quite yet, but uh, basically it works like this. The, the silos will change the dosing of the spantials. They then fall down the silos, and you literally uh, print your pill uh, right there in a, in a few seconds. Um, and the idea is to take this initially to a corner pharmacy or a PBM, but eventually have a version that you could have in your very own home. And hopefully then taking the massive amounts of data that we're collecting from our mattresses, our sleep devices, our genomics, I might, have, uh, uh, I might be in a blood thinner and have high blood pressure. And I could be measuring my uh, INR, my, how thin my blood is and my blood pressure, and I might modify my print the next morning. So literally print, you know, print that, that personalized pill every day using the crowdsourced machine learning and AI to, to optimize that going forward. And I would then take this to the next level that the future of medicine won't just be augmented intervention, but um, augmented adaptive scripts. So I have a new patient with hypertension. I don't send them home with just a tenolol. Uh, they might need three drugs. I send them home with their cartridge of, of meds, and I see how they're doing, and I can literally print a new pill uh, every day to, until we get the optimized cocktail for that individual and do that in an adaptive, real-time real -time manner. So that's a, a vision of where I think some of this can go uh, into the, into the not-so-distant future. So that's the idea of um, augmented uh, intervention. Um, I have a TED talk that just came out on this on 3D printing pills. And um, hopefully that will help catalyze some thinking. Would love your help in, in building these platforms as we go into the uh, future of health and medicine augmented and beyond. Thanks a lot. So Jill, that was a talk that's perfectly set up for your personal passion. And I find it interesting that all of this is sort of converging, right? So you're personal, personally a very high level champion for patient safety. Tell us how, um, how, this is going, how this is going, first of all, and how we can potentially even converge all of these areas. Well, I think, um, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me, Anthony. It's great to be here. Uh, I was just thinking about um, how AI would have uh, dealt with you and me. Uh, you have a pediatric cardiologist and an electrical engineer. And it would have categorized you as the guy running the patient safety movement and me, <laughs> the guy running the AI meeting. Uh, and maybe it should have, <laughs> but, but we have swapped roles here a bit. Um, but you're from Mars and I'm from Venus. Yeah, I guess, I guess. I, I have to say that... Um, <laughs> frustrated by uh, all, the, all the medical errors that lead to preventable deaths um, and seeing that the people that were trying to fix it got 
somewhere, but not far enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Several years ago, I began the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And, and um, one of the areas that I thought was ripe for fixing was decision support. Uh, I learned about a story of a boy, uh, Rory Staunton, who uh, died of sepsis. And like many of us, he had uh, been playing basketball in the gym. I think it was 12 or 13 years old at a time. Fell down, s just slipped and kind of scratched his arm. Uh, and uh, went home, was throwing up, uh, was not feeling well. Complained about a leg ache, extreme leg ache. And the parents took him to his primary physician and they did some vital signs testing. Had really high heart rate for his size. He was a big boy, but his, I think his heart rate was about 135, 140. They thought it's the stomach flu, they, or maybe he ate something bad, sent him home. Uh, he, it got so bad in the middle of the morning, they took him to the emergency room, because again, excruciating pain in the leg and uh, just not feeling well. They did a blood test, but before the results were back, they sent him home. And the boy died of sepsis. What had happened, uh, and by the way, the blood lab data came back with high white blood cell count. And uh, with a high heart rate, doctors tell me that would have normally meant it's sepsis uh, and not stomach flu, not uh, anything else. So his own bacteria had entered his bloodstream when he fell and had all of our devices, the devices we make at Massimo, the blood, uh, the lab devices, all of them, had they been communicating their data uh, I would have thought predictive algorithms, decision support algorithms, mm -hmm. would have at least said it's possible this boy has sepsis to the doctor in charge or to the nurse or to even the family. And, and I realized, you know, 20 years after, 25 years after starting my own company, how the idea of interoperability for medical devices had always been rejected and St stymied because people kept hiding behind standards. But really what they didn't want to do, they didn't want to share their data. And uh, because they thought they could monetize that data, including my own company. So I'm not, uh, I, I was guilty of that too. And, and I thought one of the things we should do is get every company in the med tech space to make a pledge to share their data. Because at this point, writing protocols to convert anyone's language into a language that your device can understand and do something about is not that difficult. So you don't really need interoperability. It would be nice, but what you really need is access to the data. Right. And if the companies are blocking the data, then you, you, you can't start. You can't do these decision support and predictive algorithms if my company's monitors won't share their data or the infusion company's products won't share their data. The, EMR companies won't share their data. So um, our hope was to create, uh, force, to force people to think 20 years from now, we're going to be retiring from our work. When we want a healthcare system that can take better care of us and, you know, and hopefully get people to share their data. Uh, fortunately, we've got about 90 companies who have. Uh, and on what's coming out, you're going to see more and more of is going to be expert systems where you know, what computers are really good at is taking massive amount of data and keeping track of it. And then if you can categorize what this set of circumstances mean by talking to experts like Anthony and Daniel, then you could uh, hopefully turn every clinician into what I call a Six Sigma clinician, right? Where they can smell a problem, they can figure out something's going wrong and, and at least diagnose properly. Uh, because what we really have become good at is the procedures of helping people, but we fail them when it comes to diagnosing them properly. We fail them when they get the wrong medication, either the wrong dose, or uh, when infection control isn't there and people get infected before they leave the hospital. You know, medical errors is now the third leading cause of death in our country. Uh, 200,000 people a year die, that's two plainful people a day. And, uh, and here we have this incredible medical system where they provide miracles for patients, 
but then on their way home, something happens to them after a very successful uh, heart surgery or a knee implant or whatever, something goes wrong and, and they die. And so we've come up with these 16 actionable patient safety solutions because to err is human, but to not put processes in place that can avoid those human errors from becoming fatal, we believe it's inhumane. And um, so we started looking at what goes wrong. We came up with these checklists or recipes of what you could do to fix the problem. And um, around 5,000 hospitals have now implemented wow. some or all of them. Uh, by the way, Children's Hospital of Orange County is the first children's hospital in the world to implement all of them. So a big round of applause to uh, Matt and the team. And the other one, UC Irvine is the first academic hospital to implement all of them. Uh, last year, they, they reported 81,000 lives saved annually. Uh, we hope to report better numbers this January. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's... Uh, so to get back to the AI, you know, we... Uh, as an engineer, I know, I studied expert systems and artificial intelligence when I was much younger and adaptive filters and things like that. And um, they're, they're very powerful tools, but they're not the end all. And uh, what you need, you need uh, more sensors. Sensors fix things. I often wonder if we had more sensors in our own body, what else we would perceive. Uh, but. Uh, but I think what we need is measuring the right things that matter, not measuring what we can measure. I worry about these watches, uh, measuring AFib. Okay, AFib is not probably what you really wish you could measure. What you really wish you could measure is, am I having a heart attack? Hmm. Uh, because by the way, there's way too many procedures to cure AFib. That's, nothing, that's not gonna be problematic to you if you don't touch it all these ablations and their side effects. So I think it's really important as a society, we figure out, okay, what are the biggest problems? Yeah. What can we do to solve them? Take actions to solve them, instead of getting distracted by all the things that, like a kitty cat chasing uh, laser beams, anyway. Yeah, no, that's a great summary <laughs> of your movement. And you. you'd be interested in knowing that we had an international session on AI medicine, and some of the panels were admitting that um, safety and the number of patients killed per year is actually higher than number three in some countries. Yeah. They just don't make it public or they, they don't look into it. So um, I totally agree with you that seems to be an evolution here. You have a lot of things available and getting very sophisticated very quickly, exponentially. And on the other hand, we're not doing some of the basic things right. And that's where a lot of lives can still be saved. So how, I think, the three of you are perfect to answer this question. How do you reconcile that sort of divergence of having a lot of things available and sophisticated technology at the same time, we can't even do basic things well like deal with mental health and deal with compliance of patients on medications. It might be good to have a poly pill, but we almost need a couple with that, some way to make sure that they get that pill because it's, a very, it's, it's, sad, it's even more sad when something is so good that they still are not getting it because of a simple compliance issue. So how do you reconcile that divergence? Well, I think it's important we measure things and understand things, and then we prioritize things. Uh, I think, uh, you know, that old saying, what, what's measured improves, uh, what's, and um, what's measured publicly improves faster, uh, or is discussed publicly improves faster. I think we, um, I think we just really need to understand the problems we're dealing with, which one of them can we solve and collectively solve mm -hmm. them. Uh, I think easy picking is solving the medical error problems in our hospitals. Uh, that's, that's an easy one. There are known steps uh, that we could take to minimize uh, hospital-acquired infection, mm -hmm. known steps we could take to minimize opioid overdose, known steps we can take to minimize CLAPSI. And uh, we got to go do those. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I run a company that manufactures things, and if in the manufacturing line uh, we start getting more failures than we expect, we stop right. the line right. until we figure out what's wrong, fix it, and go. And I, and I sometimes say that maybe we should stop all elective surgeries until every hospital 
has put all the processes in place to avoid uh, preventable deaths. We almost have to have the same attitude that I had a chance to visit uh, SpaceX and they talked about the technology there. It's, it's, when anything is errant, they immediately, the entire team stops and solve it on the spot, real time, and then go on. And we almost have to have the attitude with our patients, right? And well, part of the challenge is, you know, healthcare is, is human meets technology. And now there's more transparency. You can go, uh, ProPublica published a couple years ago, you can go online and see a surgical scorecard. So you can go to individual, you're going to get a knee surgery, you want to pick the best surgeon. Now you can go to the hospital and look at the complication rates of individual yeah. surgeons. But, you know, the docs don't want to have that data shown necessarily unless you're number one. Um, so the challenge is you might know who's a good or a safer doctor who has less infections. But then how do you get folks to, to change now that there's more transparency? How do you fix the human part of the equation? Is it sh showing the bad apples, or is it um, uh, giving new tools to the folks who need to improve their hand washing? Is there, how do you blend those modalities? I don't know if there's a... Well, uh, by the way, I think as imperfect as all these measurement techniques are, they're all important. And then what's important is how do you weigh them all mm -hmm. and, and to your decision support or what, what to do. And I think there's a good application for maybe AI. But, but I also uh, think that... Um, Every hospital, every quarter, should report their number of medical harms and how and the, the type of medical mm -hmm. harm. Um, I think every hospital should report publicly their outcome on every type of cases that they deal with uh, so that two things happen. Not only they get to see themselves compared to everybody else and they want to be better. Everybody wants to be better. It's kind of like, you know, am I running faster than the other guy? Uh, but also, I think uh, patients will see mm -hmm. uh, where, where to go, uh, what to do. Uh, well, to Daniel's point, there have been some very famous institutions that recently took big hits for not doing the basics right. They may have some very famous doctors in their, on their campus, but the staff was, you know, was not up for that level of um, respect because of the basic things that fell through. So maybe some of these things can just be automated with some of the AI tools that we have already. Yeah. and not have the humans in the loop all the time. So, yeah. so There's an inter interesting blend of sort of AI, machine learning, and even uh, vision. So you can record a surgery, you can be watching someone in an intuitive surgical platform and watch what they're doing and give them early warning, recognizing what's happening and finding, you know, like, you, like your GPS, you give you a warning that there's a yeah. cop down the road and you need to slow down. Those sorts of things can start to inform the sort of procedural safety element and sort of upskill yeah. someone who's an average surgeon yeah. to be a super safe and more effective one. Yeah, no, I, it's funny how you mentioned um, sort of automated warnings because I, I, um, I have a Tesla and it's really good at that. Um, prevented maybe a couple of cloaks hauls by just giving me a, a red car warning that the car ahead of me or maybe even the car ahead of the car that's in front of me is decelerating too quickly yeah. and I should take notice. And yeah. I think it's really, it would be great to have in healthcare, you're about to make a, a fatal error that somehow there's an alarm to stop you. Now, as long as we don't have, you know, alarm fatigue, I think would be, because right now we do have alarm fatigue. Because yeah. alarms, <laughs> you know, the alarms that don't matter, um, but hopefully the alarms will matter and we'll have some more signal in the noise. So we're going to give the last word to you, Leslie. So uh, you have a room full of uh, doctors and technology mavens and what would you like to ask them to do for, for you and your daughter? Um, I think I, I really appreciate that everyone is here today and furthering their education, um, learning more about how to keep advances going. Um, it's very humbling, it's, it's very inspiring as a true life patient and a mom of a patient. So I, I appreciate everyone being here um, and everyone who's made that possible. Um, I would just ask that you keep continuing to educate yourself um, and pushing forward and everyone here is, is moving forward and trying to grow and that can be a scary process. Um, it can be a humbling process and uh, I like the idea that everyone here has really kept their egos in check um, and hasn't been afraid to continue to push themselves because that is where the advances will come when we overcome that fear um, and continue to move forward. So I, I guess I would just ask everyone to continue to do that and thank, thank you all, everyone in here, for your work. Thank you. Well, I think it's, um, thank you, the three of you, for your time and I, I think having Leslie next to me reminds us, and I m made this comment that you asked about 
which is the best thing about technology and AI and everything else we're doing is hopefully it will rehumanize medicine back to when it was really, I think in some ways, um, more human. Uh, so the technology should actually enable that rather than uh, uh, block that process. So with that, we're going to have a quick transition and then Daniel's going to take us through the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.